Josh Hammers here, host of America on Trial. Watch that, listen to that podcast uh, about all these trials. And Josh, I remember we've been doing this for a while now since all these four different court cases have been going on. And here we are, one of them now in the books. Pretty unbelievable. Um, so I got to ask you the question of the special. Can Donald Trump be president in jail? So let's first discuss whether or not he is actually going to jail, I guess. Then we can get to that second question. So the sentencing is coming up on, on July 11th. Look, personally, Mike, I think that they are going to do everything they possibly can to justify putting him in jail. Why? Because they have already crossed like five to 25, maybe even like a thousand Rubicons at this point. You know, people are like, oh, we've crossed the Rubicon. We're at a point of no return. I mean, from my perspective, you know, we crossed the Rubicon when the Obama administration started suing nuns, the, like the little sisters of the poor, just to subsidize abortifacients. We crossed the Rubicon back during the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearing in 2018. We crossed the Rubicon back when the billions of dollars in damage from the Antifa Black Lives Matter riots in 2020 essentially were, you, you know, no one has seemed to care about that from COVID-19, no accountability. For, we, we, we have crossed so many Rubicons in this country. And when it comes to Trump in particular, I have no doubt that they are going to try to put him in jail. Here is the one reason why maybe, maybe they actually can't do it. it they logistically might actually not be able to. And it's terrible. It, it is horrifying that we were even having this conversation. But logistically, the way this works is you would have to send him to Rikers Island or to some other New York City prison. The problem is that in New York City in the prison system, including Rikers, which presumably they try to send him to because it's the most infamous of all the bunch, you can't actually get guns or arms anywhere near the prisoners. They have very well-established protocols. There are actual hard, hard, hard barriers and whatnot there. But it is federal mandate, it is federal law that the president must have armed secrets, secret service near him in perpetuity for the rest of his life. So, you know, it's, it's a basic constitutional principle under the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution that federal law trumps state law when there's any kind of conflict there. And so they actually might not be able to do it. But when there's a will, there's a way, Mike. I don't underestimate these demons and savages that we're dealing with either. Gosh, that's such an unbelievable con Like, I'm so taken back by this entire special that we're having right now. The logistics of how the Secret Service would defend Trump in Rikers Island. Like, would you, like, deputize a Secret Service agent as a prison guard so then they would be able to protect him while in prison? Like, you build a different wing off the prison just for president? Like, what? I, like you said, the will is a way. I don't think that would hold them back. What could, what would... Like, what moral thing would hold them back at this point? You know what I mean? Like, like at what point would they be like, all right, all right, yeah. we've done enough here. Let's not put the man actually in jail. So let's, let's play this out a little bit more. I mean, let's say that they somehow are able to reconcile this puzzle that I presented here and square this circle, and they somehow find <laughs> a way to, to actually get the Secret Service inside Rikers Island in you know, solitary confinement or something outrageous like that. Okay, I, I, I actually increasingly don't think that's, that, that's going to happen, but let, let, let's stipulate just for sake of argument that it does. If Donald Trump then literally wins a presidential election from, from a prison cell in, in November 2024, call me naive, I have to assume, I have to assume that Kathy Hochul, the governor of New York, would probably issue a pardon at that point. Because at that point, you're literally looking at the president-elect, soon to be president of the United States come January 2025, being in a literal prison cell. Now, there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that precludes this. There, there is no express stipulation in the, in federal constitutional or statutory law that says that a, a president of the United States cannot preside over the country from prison. You know, the reason why that's not there in the law is because who in the world would have ever thought that this was a possibility? I mean, like the, the founding fathers were talking about like political philosophy and, and all these grand stuff. <laughs> they didn't have time to talk about the possibility that someone could govern the country from jail. So it's, it's, it's not in there. So in, in theory, it kind of sort of could happen. You know, so Trump could in theory have his Nelson Mandela moment, so to speak, where he actually wins an election from jail. I, again, I call me naive and uh, I, I, it would be the first time someone's called me that. I have to believe that the pressure brought on Kathy Hochul at that point to issue a pardon would would be astronomical. I think that you would have any literally everybody, but the hardest of the hard, hard, hard left of the Democratic Party who will be saying, okay, 
at this point, like we need a functional president. This country has an economy. We have a border. We have foreign relations. We need someone, whatever you might think of him, who can literally just sit there and do the duties of a president. So at that point, that's probably the way it would work. But there is nothing necessarily forcing Kathy Hochul either to make that decision. And that, but this all assumes that they would let him win <laughs> at all right. in the first place, too. Like, let's say he gets sentenced to, to Rikers or whatever. That's right before the RNC. So they could keep him from the RNC, right? Maybe they do like some symbolic, you're in jail for a week kind of thing. Um, who would run the campaign, right? Do you have the vice president at that point? It would be the, the phase. And would they, would, do you think this would help Trump? Right. So I didn't touch on this. So thanks for that. But like, if there is a, let, let's say it is a jail sentence. Or even if it's even if it's house arrest, probation, whatever the sentence actually is, the the appeals court could immediately stay that. You know, Trump's lawyers will obviously immediately appeal that. The appellate court could stay that pending appeal, and they could do that within minutes, within hours. I, I think that probably will happen at this point. I mean, I mean, this case, mm -hmm. as we've covered on on America on trial, as we covered here on the first time and time again. This case was so unbelievably riddled with clear reversible error, whether it comes to the 14th Amendment due process clause or various Sixth Amendment rights. The fact that the judge obviously should have been recused. Trump couldn't call their lead expert witness, Brad Smith, the former FEC commissioner. I could go on and on. This, this case was uniquely, uniquely and historically flawed for countless reasons. So at a bare minimum, I would be optimistic that the New York Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in the land in New York, it's in Albany, the state capital, I have to think that they would probably stay an actual prison sentence if, God forbid, that is the decision that comes down on July 11th. So that would allow Trump to go to the convention, it would allow him to campaign out in the, out in the Midwest states and so forth there. Heaven forbid, it, again, it, let's just cut, do the whole sake of argument thing. If they do the prison sentence and the New York Court of Appeals does not stay, then yeah, I guess he's I guess he's in prison. He wouldn't be able to formally accept the the Republican Party's presidential nomination at the convention in Milwaukee in wow. July. And at that point, you know, you'd have moderate independent voters, Mike, who I think are looking at this and being like, what the actual hell is happening right now? <laughs> what was there any reason to believe why the New York Court of Appeals is some, um, you know, vaulted noble arbiters of truth and was an injustice. So it's so two things here. One is so so the New York State judiciary is very complicated. So, so you have the New York trial courts, Wamershan is a trial court. Confusingly, they call that the Supreme Court. New York's the only state in the country where the word Supreme Court does not actually refer to the highest court in the land, it refers to the trial courts. Then the intermediate court is the appellate division of the New York Supreme Court. Both the trial court judges and the appellate division of the Supreme Court are elected, they serve 14 year terms. So that is why I'm not particularly optimistic that the appellate division would do anything because if you're actually running for election in Manhattan, which is a very far left jurisdiction, obviously, you do not wanna run for, re for re-election on the platform that you stayed at Donald Trump's sentencing, his prison mandate. But I think if Trump's lawyers can expedite an appeal to the court in Albany, the, the New York Court of Appeals, which is the highest court in New York, they will be on much firmer ground for the very simple reason that one, that is not an elected court. Those ju those justices are, are are nominated and consent, very similar to how we do it at a federal level. And two, you know, kind of the broader thing here is, you know, New York State has a reputation in theory to preserve, in theory, because I grew up there and it's gone very far downhill ever since then. New York State and New York City was the commercial and financial and in many ways the cultural cultural capital of the Western world for a very, very long time. So at a certain fundamental level, in addition to the justices not serving actual terms there, they're a little more insulated from the political process, they surely have at least some consideration to bear in mind when it comes to preserving whatever little integrity of the New York judicial system might actually remain. Great point. About uh, 30 seconds left. Uh, what about the Supreme Court jumping in early on this and just putting the kibosh on it before it goes through all that and other stuff? So, you know, I raised this possibility actually recently to a, to a group chat of a bunch of fellow right-wing lawyers. And one of my friends, who, who I won't name obviously, but he's a former U.S. Supreme Court clerk himself, he said it's a very bad idea for the very simple reason that you would actually be jumping over possible levels of relief in the interim and you'd be, you'd be putting all of your eggs in the basket of the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, I don't know about you, Mike, but I, I, I don't particularly want to trust John Roberts, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett to necessarily do the right thing. They don't always do the right thing here. And if you jump over the New York Court of Appeals and go straight to the U.S. Supreme Court, 
you're not going to be able to go back easily to the New York Court of Appeals. So, so, so you, it's a very, very risky uh, proposition. I'm not confident in it. Oh, very interesting. Josh Hammer, America on trial if you want all this and more with the three other trials that Trump is still facing right now as well. Josh, great to talk to you, brother. You bet. Anytime.